Thanks to the crazy stunts they pull off and their iconic characters, fans tend to forget WWE wrestlers are regular humans. Well, they are, and this video is a cruel reminder of that fact as we go through the WWE wrestlers who were killed. And nope, we're not talking about their character's storyline dying. These are actual cases of wrestlers being murdered in real life, so be sure to stick around. Starting off with the murder of Tank Morgan. You probably don't know who Tank Morgan is, and quite frankly, you're not expected to, except you're a wrestling historian or something. Morgan's from the era back when it was the WWF, many years before it was called the WWF, and later the WWE we know it to be today. This man started his wrestling career way back in the 1950s and spent the next couple of decades competing in quite a number of wrestling territories, both in the US and abroad. At the peak of his career, Morgan had a feud with legendary WWF champion Bruno Sammartino, with the two having an epic two out of three falls match at the Madison Square Garden in 1966. As a WWF wrestler, Morgan was also known to be rivals with Ox Baker, Armin Hussian, and Tony Parisi. However, he only spent just over a year in what we now know to be the WWE. After leaving the WWF in 1967, Morgan would go on to compete in Japan for international wrestling enterprise, as well as some promotions in Florida and Georgia. After over two decades in pro wrestling, Tank Morgan retired in 1974 and pretty much stayed out of the public eye completely. Until August 15, 1991, when news broke that the former wrestler had been shot dead. Morgan had been walking his dog in Las Vegas, Nevada, when suddenly a car drove by and shot him in front of a high school. A police officer was able to rush to the scene and take the unconscious Morgan to the University Medical Center, but it was too late. Morgan was pronounced dead on arrival. Now, this was a 58-year-old man who didn't have much history of getting into trouble, so his getting shot was a surprise to everyone. Quite frankly, his death still hasn't been explained or his killer identified. The general assumption, however, is that Morgan was a victim of mistaken identity. Other than that, we'll probably never know why he was killed. On the other hand, the death of this next wrestler is a bit more explanatory. His name, Dino Bravo. Having started training as a wrestler since the age of 12, Dino, or should we say, Adolfo Bresciano, was pretty much primed for greatness, and he quite delivered on the expectations. After training under Gino Brito, he started his professional career in the early 1970s and spent the next decade establishing himself as one of the biggest wrestling superstars in Canada. Dino's impressive record in Canada includes him winning the Canadian International Heavyweight Championship six times, the NWA Canadian Heavyweight Championship, and the NWA Mid-Atlantic Tag Team Championship. It wasn't until 1986 that he made the move to sign with the WGWF, but Dino was coming in as an entirely different character from the persona he was known as. Bleaching his brown hair to blonde and becoming way more muscular, Dino became a heel in the WJWF, having turned on the Rougeau brothers. He also changed his wrestling style to a more physical approach, relying more on power than technique. His new gimmick worked, and Dino won the WWF World Tag Team Championship with Dominic DiNucci and also held the WWF Canadian Championship title till its abandonment in 1988. After a pretty decent career, Bravo retired from professional wrestling in 1992 and began training wrestlers in Montreal, Canada. But that wasn't the only thing he spent his retirement doing. Apparently, the Canadian strongman allegedly got involved in surreptitious cigarette smuggling. He was also rumoured to have been involved in organised crime for the Cotroni Mafia, which is pretty believable given he was a nephew by marriage to Montreal crime boss Vic Cotroni. How long Dino Bravo had been involved in these shady businesses is unknown, but in 1993, a $400,000 shipment he was responsible for got intercepted by the police, and from there, things went south. According to Bravo's former opponent and WWE superstar, Bret Hart, Bravo had confided in him around the time of the missing shipment and told him that he was aware his days were numbered. Soon enough, on March 10th, 
1993, Bravo's vices caught up with him, apparently in the most brutal manner, as he was found dead after being shot 17 times in his Quebec home. Damn. No one was ever convicted for his murder, but it doesn't take a detective to know Dino Bravo's death had to do with his mafia affiliations. Although we've seen two unsolved murders involving WWE wrestlers, this next one did get solved, if that's any consolation. Bruiser Brody, born as Frank Goodish. Brody is one of the forefathers of hardcore wrestling. This guy came into the wrestling world back in the 70s, but to date, very few wrestlers can be said to be more hardcore than him. Whether he was in the ring as Bruiser Brody, King Kong Brody, the Masked Marauder, or Red River Jack, one thing was sure. At least one person would leave the ring all bloodied. Trained by Fritz von Erich, Brody fought in literally a number of wrestling promotions, including the Worldwide Wrestling Federation, Southwest Championship Wrestling, American Wrestling Association, and World Class Championship Wrestling. As a wrestler, he was not only hardcore in the ring, but also very protective of his image. So protective that he would sometimes go off script and dish out a good beating to his opponent during a fight he was scripted to lose. Such misdoings weren't enough to keep him from getting inducted into the halls of fame of most of the promotions he worked in, including the WWE Hall of Fame and even the Professional Wrestling Hall of Fame. However, all of these inductions came posthumously as Brody was murdered during his career. It was July 16th, 1988, and Bruiser Brody was in a city near San Juan in Puerto Rico called Bayamon. He was scheduled to fight Dan Spivy at Juan Ramon Lubriel Stadium and was in the locker room preparing for his match. While in the locker room, fellow wrestler and booker Jose Huertas Gonzalez called on Brody to step into the shower area for them to discuss business, which he did. Now, the crazy part about this whole case is that there were no witnesses around when everything occurred. However, the story the police gave later on is that Brody and Gonzalez got into a heated argument while in the shower room. The next thing people around heard were two screams so loud the entire locker room heard. Renowned bodybuilder and wrestler Tony Atlas was the first to get to the scene, and what he met was a horrid sight of Brody bent over, holding his stomach, and Gonzalez standing over him holding a bloody knife. As you'd expect, Atlas sought medical attention immediately. However, the paramedics didn't get to the scene until nearly an hour later, thanks to the heavy traffic outdoors and a large crowd in the stadium. By the time they arrived, Tony Atlas had assisted in getting Brody into the waiting ambulance, but he had lost too much blood by then. Brody Bruiser died soon after from his stab wounds, while Jose Gonzalez was charged with murder. Guess what, though? When he appeared in court, Gonzalez decided to testify in his own defense, stating he only stabbed Brody in self-defense. And despite the presence of a witness, Gonzalez was acquitted of murder in 1989, partly thanks to the prosecution witnesses living outside of Puerto Rico who didn't show up to the trial. They all claimed they didn't get their summons until after the trial had ended, which sounds a bit shady, but by then, it didn't matter. Gonzalez had been acquitted. We have to say, though, after the whole court case, some info came out that really makes it look like Jose Gonzalez got away with murder. Tony Atlas and another fellow, Dutch Mantle, have said in an interview that Gonzalez had once threatened to kill Brody after getting ruthlessly beaten in a match against the deceased in the 70s. And it gets worse. Tony Atlas has also spoken about the shadiness of Gonzalez's arrest. He also mentioned that Bruiser Brody was about to gain ownership in the wrestling company prior to his death and had implied that he would fire Gonzalez, giving the latter motive for murder. However, all this information came to light after the trial had been concluded, and despite all the insinuations from Atlas and Brody's widow, Gonzalez has declined offers to be interviewed on the subject. This and the fact that the murder weapon was never found makes the whole case even shadier, but we'll probably never find out the truth. For a case that's more open and less of a mystery, let's check out the murder of Nancy Benoit. This case might be solved and done with, but it's important we give you a heads up. It's also one of the most disturbing murder cases in the history of sports and entertainment. Nancy Benoit 
was one of the biggest female wrestlers in the 1990s. But before picking up the Benoit surname, Nancy Sullivan started her wrestling career in the Florida Championship Wrestling in 1984 before moving to the WCW three years later. Forming an alignment with her then-husband, Kevin Sullivan, and adopting the name Woman, she moved to the ECW in 1993 before resurfacing in the WCW in 1996. It was during this spell that she became affiliated with the Four Horsemen, which consisted of Flair, Arn Anderson, Brian Pillman, and her future husband, Chris Benoit. And in case you're wondering, yeah, we're talking about the same Chris Benoit, who would become a two-time world heavyweight champion, a Royal Rumble winner, and a headliner for multiple WWE pay-per-view events. The two got married in 2000 after a three-year relationship that started as an on-screen gimmick to create a feud between Chris Benoit and Nancy's ex, Kevin Sullivan. Nancy soon went off the screen a few months into her relationship with Chris Benoit and was never recalled, while her husband went on to become one of the biggest names in the WWE. The next time her name would hit the headlines was in June 2007, when she was declared dead in the most gruesome and disturbing of cases. Nancy was killed on Friday, June 22, 2007, by her husband, Chris Benoit, in their home in Fayetteville, Georgia. Her body was found wrapped in a blanket with a copy of the Bible lying near her. Forensics showed that she had been killed by strangulation with a cord by her husband. However, there seemed to be no signs of immediate struggle. This turned out to be because her limbs and arms had already been tied up prior to her death. Pretty dark, but this is where things take an even darker turn. Nancy's body wasn't found until three days later when she was found dead with her son, Daniel Benoit, and her husband, Chris. Investigations revealed that Chris had murdered his wife and son on the 22nd of June before taking his own life by hanging himself, presumably two days later. The bodies of the family were only discovered on the 25th of June after the police were alerted. From the 22nd till the 24th, Chris Benoit spoke to his fellow wrestler and close friend Chavo Guerrero and left him some disturbing messages that prompted him to get the police involved after not hearing from Chris for about 24 hours. By the time the police arrived at the family residence, it was too late. It took weeks of investigation to put together the eerie murders, suicide case that had happened. And since then, there have been many explanations for what triggered Chris Benoit to do what he did. The most widely believed, however, is that he suffered from some chronic mental issues coupled with steroid and alcohol abuse, which led to him murdering his family and taking his own life. Whatever the true case may be, the case of the Benoit murders to suicide is undoubtedly one of the most horrifying WWE stories. Don't let that fool you, though. The remaining cases of WWE wrestlers who were killed don't get more family-friendly or easier to digest. Moving on, we have the murder of Chris Adams. The gentleman was known for many things, including being a wrestling promoter, coach, and judoka. Many remember Chris Adams as the man responsible for single-handedly training WWE great Stone Cold Steve Austin, but he's way more than that. Before wrestling, Adams had participated in professional judo tournaments and won the British National Judo Championship for his age and weight class three times by the time he was 21. With a sound knowledge of martial arts, he picked up an interest in wrestling, and over the next 23 years, Adams went on to have an extremely successful pro wrestling career, winning 26 titles. Well, that's a very impressive number of titles for any wrestler to get. So why aren't most wrestling fans familiar with the name Chris Adams? That's probably because the Englishman spent those 23 years of his career going from promotion to promotion. Adams performed for organizations like the Universal Wrestling Association, Southern Championship Wrestling, National Class Wrestling, Global Wrestling Federation, and the NWA Hollywood Wrestling. He found the most success while in World Class Championship Wrestling, where he became the World Heavyweight Champion, and it wasn't until the latter parts of his career that he stepped into the more familiar world of the WCW. Between 1997 and 1999, he had some pretty iconic matches in the WCW, 
including facing off against Randy Savage, a match officiated by J.J. Dillon and concluded with an interference by Lex Luger. Late in 1999, Adams quit the WCW because he was unsatisfied with his role as a jobber. He returned to Texas to work as a promoter, and that was pretty much it. Until April 2000, when Adams and his girlfriend of four months, Linda Kaffengst, were both found unconscious inside a friend's apartment. Turns out, the couple had been consuming a shitload of alcohol and some drug called GAHB before overdosing. Luckily for Adams, he recovered from the overdose, but just 10 hours after he regained consciousness, his girlfriend died at a local hospital. Investigations were launched into her death, and Adams, being a suspect, began living in Rowlett with his new wife Karen and their seven-year-old daughter. Surprisingly, over a year later, in June 2001, Chris Adams turned himself in on the manslaughter charges he was indicted on. He was put on the awaiting trial list, but he never got to hear the verdict for the manslaughter case, as he became a victim of one himself. Apparently, he hadn't learned from his overdose just a year prior and was getting drunk with his friend. William Brent Bure Parnell was at his home in Waxahachie, Texas on October 7, 2001. One thing left to another, and the two friends got into an argument that eventually got out of hand and ended with Parnell shooting Adams in the chest with a .38 caliber handgun. The former wrestler died immediately at the age of 46 and his friend was charged in court. However, Parnell pleaded it was self-defense and despite being the gun owner, he was acquitted of all charges and let go. Sounds familiar, right? Anyway, Chris Adams was killed but no one got jailed for his murder, and it seemed no one was particularly sad about his demise, seeing that Steve Austin, who was assumed to be his protege, said this after his death. I'm sorry he got killed, but the guy did not have good karma. That's a pretty cold thing to say, even for stone-cold Steve Austin. As we approach the end of our list of WWE wrestlers who got killed, we have a case that could honestly make a good movie script. The death of La Parquita, and Espectrito too. Yeah, this time, it involves not just one, but two wrestlers getting killed, born Alberto Perez Jimenez and Alejandro Perez Jimenez. These two dudes were real-life twin brothers who were midget professional wrestlers, or as they are called in Mexico, Mini Estrella Luchador. Yeah, dwarf wrestling is a thing in Mexico. It always has been. The twins were trained by their older brother, Mario Perez Jimenez who worked as Espectrito and went on to have careers in pro wrestling from 1990 till their death in 2009. We have to mention, though, that one succeeded more than the other. Alejandro, who went by the name Espectro too, was the more successful of the two, having not only worked for Mexican professional wrestling promotions Asistencia, Asesoria y Administración, but also the International Wrestling Revolution Group, the Mexican Independent Circuit, and the WWF. Yup, in 1997, Vince McMahon came up with the idea to start a talent exchange between the AAA and the WWF, resulting in the AAA sending some of their minis to work for the WWF. Alejandro was one of the selected few, and upon his arrival in the WWF, he was repackaged as a miniature version of Mankind and named Mini Mankind. He fought in the WWF till the period of the talent exchange elapsed before continuing to work in Mexico. On the other hand, his brother Alberto got fired from the AAA for missing too many shows. He spent most of his career roaming the Mexican independent circuit, never regularly working for any promotion. By 2009, most of the wrestling world had forgotten about this duo. Even the WWE didn't bring back Alejandro to reprise his role as Mini Mankind when the character was brought back in 2008. However, on June 29, 2009, the two brothers were found by hotel cleaners dead in their hotel room. Reports revealed that the brothers had checked into a hotel after a Sunday night show and hired the services of two female prostitutes. The women followed them to their hotel room, but rather than what the twins expected, the women spiked their drinks with what was believed to be eye drops mixed in with alcohol. Remember, we told you it sounds like a movie script. 
Turns out, the two women were part of a gang named La Filtration, so after the brothers passed out, the women stole their wallets and cell phones and ran away. Now, it is believed the women didn't intend to murder their victims. However, the volume of the drugs they spiked the drinks with was size relative. This means that what would have knocked out two regular-sized men caused the two dwarfs to overdose and eventually die. A month later, the Mexican police arrested one of the two women suspected to be responsible for the death of the Jimenez twins, tracking one of the twins' cell phones the women stole. Another month later, a second suspect was apprehended, and in July 2010, the two women were found guilty and sentenced to 47 years in prison. Now that's one hell of a story, isn't it? For the last story on our list, we have the murder of Ricky Lawless. Ricky who? Don't bother, you don't know him, and we don't expect you should. To be frank, Ricky Lawless never fought in the WWE, and the closest he came to it was training former ECW star Axel Rotten. That's what Ricky Lawless was. Sure, he was a professional wrestler, but he was more known for being a trainer and wrestling promoter. Ricky had spent most of his competitive wrestling career in the eastern, mid-Atlantic and southern regional territories during the early to mid-1980s. He was well known in promotions like International Championship Wrestling and the National Wrestling Federation. However, his biggest success was owning a wrestling school that produced not just Axel Rotten, but also the likes of Steve the Brawler Lawler, Playboy, Bobby Starr and Joey Maggs. Maybe good old Ricky could have had a successful wrestling career of his own. Maybe he could have even made it to the WWE. But we never got to find out, because he was killed at the young age of 28. The date of his death was November 30th, 1988, and several news outlets were on their heels to cover the story of Ricky Lawless getting shot and killed. At first, the news that broke was that Ricky had been killed by former tag partner Vladimir Koloff, However, a police investigation revealed that Ricky had been killed by 22-year-old Raymond Michael Swartz. A Hustler documentary three years later revealed that Swartz was the husband of a certain woman whom Ricky was believed to have had an affair with. Apparently, Swartz found out and, in the rage of a man scorned, took matters into his own hands and shot Ricky Lawless. Some believe there's more to the story, but what we can confirm is that soon after, Swartz was declared guilty and charged with first-degree murder of Ricky Lawless. Which of these cases do you find the most tragic? Let us know your thoughts in the comments section. And before you leave, don't forget to like this video and subscribe to Ring Rivals so you don't miss the next ones.